Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are going to talk about lipids and nucleic acids. Both are short, so we'll cover them at the same time. Before we get started, I wanted to review proteins with you a little bit. Keep in mind the monomer of a protein is an amino acid, and those come in 21 different types. All of those 21 amino acids use carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Some of those are going to use sulfur as well. Now, amino acids have some things in common. They all have this carboxyl group, COOH, and this amino group, NH2, as their functional groups. What makes them different is this R group that's going to hang off of the end. If I need to link two amino acids, I'm going to link the carboxyl group of one amino acid with the amino group of the next amino acid. And that's going to pull out a water molecule through dehydration synthesis and allow this nitrogen and carbon to bond in a peptide bond. Now, if we want to break proteins apart, you would do the opposite. You would insert a water molecule between those two functional groups during hydrolysis, and that's going to break that protein into amino acids, such as when you eat something, for example. If we're thinking about the functions of proteins, there was one function in particular I really wanted you to remember, and that was that they catalyze or speed up reactions. They can allow uh, reactions to happen at lower temperatures, like body temperature, versus the high temperatures that would be needed in nature. So proteins are considered the workhorses of the cell, though. They do all kinds of things. They're involved in structure, storage, transporting materials across membranes. They can act as antibodies, which help you get better when you're sick. And they can even act as hormones, which are involved in cell-to-cell -cell signaling. The one thing I, I ask that you not think of a protein as is an energy source. And what I mean by that is the protein that is incorporated into your body, into your muscles, for example. That's not typically going to be broken down to give you energy unless you really, really needed it if you didn't have any carbs and you didn't have any fats in your body. But the protein that you eat, for example, in that chicken sandwich we discussed in the last lecture, that can give you energy as it's broken down in your stomach and it gives about the same amount of energy as a carbohydrate. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about lipids. Lipids are not polymers in the sense of the other kinds of polymers that we've talked about. They don't have these true monomers, these repeating units that come together over and over again to give you very long lipid molecules. However, it is very helpful to think about lipids as having the monomer fatty acids. So I want you to think about lipids in that way. Fatty acids come in two types saturated and unsaturated. And you can see those molecules here. They have lots of carbon and lots of hydrogen, two atoms of oxygen at the end in this little carboxyl group, but that's it. Mostly they're carbon and hydrogen. In your discussion post, I ask that you maybe think about butter versus something like olive oil or vegetable oil and think of the differences between the two. So saturated fats like butter and cheese, for example, are animal fats and they are solids at room temperature. You can leave them out and they're not gonna melt into a complete liquid. This comes from their molecular shape. So if we can see these carbons have no double bonds between them, that's gonna give you a long straight molecule. And those can lay right on top of each other to give you a solid. Now, unsaturated fats, things like your oils, your vegetable oils, and your olive oil, for example, are plant fats. And so those are liquid at room temperature. And again, that's going to come from its molecular shape. We can see these carbons are linked together. And when you get to here, you see that there is at least one double bond. That's going to bend this molecule. So they're not going to lay together on top of each other and give you a nice solid shape. They're going to be more fluid. And that's where your liquid comes from. You can think about dumping a tube of Pringles in a bag and shaking it up. They're unlikely to just lay right back on top of each other again. And, and so that is why your unsaturated fats are typically liquid. Now, there are some exceptions to this. Um, saturated fats, you can have some that are plants like coconut oil, for example, is a saturated fat. And um, salmon actually use unsaturated fats because these unsaturated fats have a lower freezing point. So they don't freeze as easily. And you can imagine if you're a salmon living in the ocean in these really cold environments, well, you don't want your fat to freeze. So that's why they would use something like an unsaturated fat. And typically, we think of saturated fats as being bad for you and unsaturated fats as being your good fats. And it is very important that you do have some fat in your diet where you cannot exist. Fat is involved in making all of the membranes in every cell that you have. So if you were literally down to 0% body fat, then you would be dead because you couldn't actually make any cells. 
Lipids are your fats, your oils, and your waxes. The monomer for your lipids are fatty acids. Again, those are saturated and unsaturated. We looked at the molecular form of those and we saw carbon and hydrogen in very long chains with just a touch of oxygen at each end. The functions of a lipid are many, and the number one function I want you to remember is that they're for long-term energy storage. So for example, if you ate a donut for breakfast, you're either gonna burn that sugar or store it really quickly in about 20 minutes. But after that, you're gonna burn through those stored sugars and then you're gonna start breaking down your lipids. So if you've ever heard that you need to work out about 20 minutes before you start burning your fat, that would be why. Um, so a runner in a marathon would wanna make sure they had lots of fat in the diet so that when they get down past all those sugars, they've burned all those out, they still have that energy reserve. Lipids are also involved in making up cell membranes. This is called a phospholipid, and phospholipids have a phosphate head and two fatty acid tails. You can see that this one is unsaturated because it is bent, and this one is saturated because it is straight. If we put lots of these little phospholipids together, then you can get your phospholipid bilayer, which makes up your cell membrane. We'll talk about that more later. Um, lipids are also involved in insulation and waterproofing. So if you think about um, animals that live in the poles, for example, they have lots and lots of fat in their diet because it's cold. It's going to help them retain body heat a little bit better. And especially with animals that live in the water, then they're going to need to um, insulate themselves and waterproof. Uh, lipids can also act as hormones. There are certain lipid hormones, just like there are certain protein hormones. And again, if you've got some fat, that's going to protect against physical shock. So if you fall, you're less likely to break something if you've got that cushion. So lipid polymers, we mentioned phospholipids on the last slide. So phospholipids are a major component in cell membranes. I mentioned the phosphate head and the two fatty acid tails. Those don't always have to be saturated and unsaturated. You can mix that up and have two unsaturated or two saturated as well. Um, but they do help your membrane stay fluid and movable. So I can do this because I have lipids like cholesterol, for example, um, in the diet. Triglycerides are the primary way that animals are going to store their fat. And so you have this glycerol backbone, which you see here, and we have some fatty acids attached to that glycerol molecule. So tri means three, and there are three fatty acids attached to this glycerol. Let's see if you know what they are, what kinds of fatty acids are these. If you look at this first one, you see that double bond there. So that means this is an unsaturated fat. Same with this one at the bottom. We see we have at least one double bond between these carbons, so this is an unsaturated fat. This one in the middle, however, is a saturated fat. There are no double bonds between those carbons. So those fatty acids do not always have to be arranged in this order. You can mix and match your fatty acids um, to give you different kinds of triglycerides. But these are long-term energy storage molecules for us animals. Foods that are hot in unsaturated fats are typically going to be your plants and your plant oils. Uh, peanut butter has some unsaturated fats. It comes from peanuts, nuts, and seeds. Um, but we also have fatty fish, and I mentioned how salmon use unsaturated fats because it has a lower freezing point, and that's going to help them in these very cold climates. Your saturated fats you can typically think of as your animal products, your cheese, butter, creams, your meats. Um, any kinds of processed meat, but then we have a couple of examples of plants here, palm and coconut oil that can also give you saturated fat. So a couple of exceptions to the rule, but in general, we have our plant fats and we have our animal fats over here. So we already looked at how you would test for lipids in your online lab. Um, this is the results of your spot test. So you can see that we have a greasy or shiny spot in the um, peanut oil and in the peanut butter, but the rest of these pretty much leave no spot when they are dried. So this indicates that we have lipids here, but the rest of these food groups were very low if they had any lipids in them at all. The solubility test was another method we used to test for lipids, and we just dropped the food in water to see if it would dissolve, and we can see that we have this layer here, and that would indicate that you would have lipids present in that food group. A quick summary of lipids, they do have long chains of carbon and hydrogen with a little bit of oxygen at the end of those chains. They're about 12 to 18 carbons long. Um, you don't necessarily need to know that, but I put it there in case you're curious. 
The monomer are fatty acids and they're two kinds, saturated and unsaturated. The biggest function I want you to remember is long-term energy, so you break this down after your sugars are done in your body. You will need to know eventually that phospholipids make up cell membranes, so if you can go ahead and commit that to memory now, you'll be ahead of the game. They're involved in waterproofing and insulation, especially in animals that live at the poles. They serve as hormones, different kinds of hormones than uh, proteins serve as, and they can protect from physical shock. So if you fall down, your bones are going to be a little bit more protected if you have some fats. Examples of lipids, we talked about oils, fats, waxes would be another. Triglycerides, remember that's three fatty acids attached to a glycerol molecule, and this is how animals primarily store their lipids. We had the phospholipids with the phosphate head and two fatty acid tails, and those are involved in cell membranes. Cholesterol, which is why you can pinch your skin and it doesn't break. The cholesterol kind of helps to keep your um, membranes fluid. And then steroids. If you've ever known anyone to take steroids, then oftentimes they end up with acne on their face or on the rest of their body, and that comes from the injection of lipids into the body in excess. All right, so now we're going to cover nucleic acids. So the monomer for a nucleic acid is called a nucleotide. They use the elements carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus, and they have three parts. And if you can remember the three parts, then you can remember your elements. So the phosphate group is seen here, and this is where that phosphorus is going to come from. We also have a pentose sugar, not pentose like the beans, but pentose, penta for five, and os for sugar. So we have one, two, three, four, five carbons. We also have a five-sided figure here. A pentagon, which is an exception to your hexagon rule for carbs. I told you we would see several of those throughout the semester. You have two different kinds of sugars that can be used, deoxyribose and ribose, and which one you use depends on the type of nucleic acid you're trying to make. Keep in mind that carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are used in carbohydrates, so if you can remember that sugars are carbohydrates, then you've got those three elements here. The last element we have is nitrogen, and that's going to be found in this nitrogenous base here. There are five different nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, and uracil. Usually they are referred to by their first letter. A, C, and G are used in all nucleic acids, but thymine and uracil are only used in certain nucleic acids, and we'll, we'll talk about those differences in a little while. So nucleic acids only have one function. They code for the order that amino acids are going to be assembled to give you a protein. And that's what we call your genetic information. There are two main types of nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, and they both use the monomer nucleotides. Now keep in mind that nucleotides have these nitrogenous bases. DNA is going to use A, G, T, and C, and RNA will use A, G, C, and U. The order of these chemicals in a nucleic acid is going to specify the order of that protein and how it's going to be put together. They are soluble in water, which means that they're polar, and we are going to look more at how proteins are, are made from nucleic acids later. Right now, I just want you to know that they code for proteins using the order of these nitrogenous bases. So we talked about how DNA and RNA are types of nucleic acids, and there are some differences between the two that we'll look at. This is DNA here. You can see that you have a double helix. You have two backbones that are sugar and phosphate. We're going to use deoxyribose in this DNA, and your A is going to go with a T, and C will go with a G. And again, the order and how we read these A, C's, T's, and G's is going to determine the code for that protein. Now, when we look at RNA, we have just a single helix. We've got our sugar phosphate backbone. The nucleobases or the nitrogenous bases are sticking out in what would be the middle. So it's a single coil. And notice the difference in the bases. Uh, DNA is going to use this thymine, and RNA is going to use this uracil. All foods are going to have nucleic acids in them. DNA and RNA are absolutely essential for making proteins. So you, when you eat something that is or once was alive, then it's going to have to have these nucleic acids in you. Quick little summary of nucleic acids. We have our elements, everything but sulfur, so CHONOP, C-H-O-N-P. We also have the twisted ladder shape in DNA, and we just have a, a single helix in RNA. The monomer for both is going to be a nucleotide with your phosphate, sugar, and nitrogenous base as the three parts. 
the function, and there's only one, to store genetic information. Those nitrogenous bases are going to be in a certain order, and that's going to code for the order of the amino acids in the protein. And we have some examples. DNA and RNA are the two I really want you to think of. ATP is used for energy, and it's a special type of nucleic acid with three phosphates instead of one, and it's going to use an adenine base. All right, that's everything for lipids and nucleic acids. So please complete your final assignments and quizzes, and then we will have the test later on this week.